Hello and welcome back to my channel. I hope you've been having a wonderful day. I am back in the world of the living. Finals are over and I think they went well, but at this point I don't really care. I'm just glad that they're over. We're going to be jumping back in with the series I'm doing on the Gilded Age families and today we're going to be covering the Gould family. Jay Gould is really the quintessential robber baron and let me tell you, this guy makes the term robber baron make a lot of sense because uh, he was. He was a robber baron in every sense of the word. So let's jump in. was born on May 27th, 1836 to Mary Moore and to John Burr Gould in Roxbury, New York. He showed an early skill in mathematics, but his father, who was just a poor farmer, was unable to educate him. Undeterred, Jay Gould decided to pay his own way through school, so he left home with 50 cents in his pocket and a bundle of clothing and headed to the nearest academy. He was able to land a job as a bookkeeper for a blacksmith, and after he'd finished his schooling, he bounced around between different careers for a while. But it was through railroad speculation that Jay Gould became truly wealthy. During the Great Financial Panic of 1857, Gould began buying stocks in the Rutland and Washington Railroad for 10 cents on the dollar, eventually leaving him in control of the company. He also bought stocks in the Rensselaer and Saratoga Railroad in 1863. In 1868, he tried to take control of the Erie Railroad, of which he was a co-owner, from Cornelius Vanderbilt, you know, Commodore Vanderbilt. There's another video I made about him. I'll link it in the cards up there. Who was another co-owner of this railroad? And this became known as the Erie Wars. This is just one of many illegal scandals in which Jay Gould was involved. Gould and two other of the co-owners, Daniel Drew and James Fisk, conspired to oust Vanderbilt by manipulating the Erie Railroad stock. They issued spurious stocks which had the effect of watering down the Erie Railroad stock. This is illegal. Cornelius Vanderbilt bought quite a few of these fraudulent shares and eventually lost about $7 million. And while Jay Gould did eventually return most of this money, under the threat of litigation, he did not invite Vanderbilt back to the company of which Gould had become president. Around this same time, Jay Gould and James Fisk became involved in Tammany Hall, which was the driving political force in New York State and New York City at this time. Now, this whole debacle could be a video in and of itself. It's incredibly complicated, but the short version of it is that there was a lot of underhand dealing. The simplified version is that Gould and Fisk made the boss of Tammany Hall, William M. Boss Tweed, a director of the Erie Railroad. And in exchange, Tweed arranged for legislation favorable both to the railroad and to Gould and Fisk. Tweed was arrested for corruption in 1871 and was held on a bail of $1 million, of which a large part was paid by, you guessed it, Jay Gould. Nothing sketchy there at all. Tweed was eventually convicted for fraud and corruption and died in prison. This man is very interesting and honestly, he could be a whole video of his own. Maybe he will be in the future if you're interested, but I don't have time to delve into all of his peculiarities right now. At this same time, in 1869, Gould became involved in, one could even say responsible for, the Black Friday Gold Panic. One could say that he was responsible for it because he was. Gould and Fisk, the dynamic duo, partnered with a man named Abel Corbin, who was the brother-in-law of President Ulysses S. Grant, in a scheme to buy up as much gold as they could in an attempt to illegally corner the gold market and to artificially inflate the price of gold on the New York Stock Exchange. This is, again, a very complicated situation and could be a video in and of itself, but I'm going to give you the incredibly pared down version and it's going to be missing a lot of detail, but it should give you a basic idea of the gold panic. So President Grant had a policy of exchanging war bonds and greenbacks, which is a slang term for paper money, for gold from the United States Treasury at weekly intervals. This was done to pay off the national debt, stabilize the US dollar, and boost the economy. You have to remember that this is right on the heels of the American Civil War and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and the United States economy was still shaky, to say the very, very least. This reintroduction of gold into the economy kept the price of gold down. 
Gould and Fisk were able to use Corbyn's relationship with the president to convince Grant to stop this policy of reintroducing gold into circulation. They didn't tell Grant why they wanted him to stop doing this, obviously. He never would have agreed if they if he knew it was just to make them money. So they came up with some reason that seemed plausible to President Grant. Because gold was quickly beginning to disappear from circulation, its price began to artificially inflate. At the same time, Gould and Fisk bought up as much gold as they could while the price was low. This hoarding of gold artificially drove the price even higher. Their goal was to hoard as much gold as they possibly could and eventually corner the market. Now, this on its own would not be illegal, but Gould and Fisk went beyond just buying up gold. They bribed several government officials to uh, keep gold out of circulation, and of course they used a, an unfair relationship with the president in order to get him to cancel his policy of introducing gold into circulation. Which brings this into Crimesville. Whoop whoop, all aboard the Crimesville Express. Alas for our dynamic duo, President Grant eventually caught wind of what they were doing and ordered that the process of redeeming gold be restarted again. And the price of gold fell from, and I'm going to have to look at my notes for this, $160 per 4.83 troy ounces, which is about 5.3 regular ounces, to $138 per 4.83 troy ounces. This entire ordeal took place over the course of just 24 days. This sudden rise and equally sudden fall in the US gold market devastated the American economy for months. Stock prices dropped by about 20%, dozens of brokerage firms went bankrupt, and there was a run on the 10th National Bank. But everybody seems to agree that farmers were the ones to suffer the worst, as always seems to happen when rich people play with the economy. I'm going to be looking at my notes again so I can be sure to get the numbers right. As a result of the gold panic, the price of wheat fell from $1.40 per bushel to $0.77 cents per bushel, corn fell from $0.95 cents per bushel to $0.68 cents per bushel, and other cereal crops experienced similar losses. The scandal also damaged President Grant's reputation, even though he was not to blame. He didn't know what was going on, and when he found out, he put a stop to it. And it also damaged America's reputation in the international economy. Gould and Fisk were able to escape conviction because they were rich, but they were forced to spend all of their ill-gotten profits on fancy legal defenses. But Jay Gould, being Jay Gould, was not done. In 1873, he once again tried to seize full control of the Erie Railroad. This time he enlisted the help of a Scottish nobleman named Lord Gordon Gordon. And when I was uh, writing the script for this video, I promised myself that I was not going to make a remark on how silly that name is, but I mean, come on, Lord Gordon Gordon. Anyhow, Lord Gordon Gordon convinced Gould that he, Gordon Gordon, could help him, Gould, take control of the railroad with the help of Europeans who owned stock in the company. To clinch the deal, Gould bribed Gordon Gordon with a million dollars in Erie Railroad stocks. Alas for Gould, Lord Gordon Gordon was not actually a lord, he was a con man, and as soon as he got his hands on these stocks, he cashed them in and absconded to Canada. So Gould sued Lord Gordon Gordon and tried to get him sent back to the United States. The Canadian government refused, and Gould then... <laughs> This sounds like something out of a, like a telenovela or out of like a, a Penny Dreadful. Gould then sent associates to kidnap Gordon Gordon and bring him back to the United States. But the drama does not end there. They succeeded in kidnapping Gordon Gordon, but they were apprehended by the Mounties and arrested. The, the uh, Gould's associates were arrested in Canada. This nearly led to an armed conflict between the United States and Canada, but it was fortunately averted. Now, eventually the Canadian authorities decided to deport Gordon Gordon back to Europe. They'd been contacted by some people whom he'd swindled there, and they were just gonna let the European courts deal with this. But before they could actually follow through on this, he shot himself in the head on August 1st, 1874, whereupon he died. Back to Jay Gould, due to the bad press created by this whole debacle, in addition to the bad press created by the gold panic, which was still very fresh in everybody's memories at this point of time, he was forced out of the Erie Railroad in 1873. There's a lot more that I could say about this man, but I think you get the picture. In 1891, he was quoted as saying, I could hire one half of the farmers in the United States to shoot the other half to death. Jay Gould died of the consumption in 1892. His fortune was estimated at $72 million, which is the equivalent of 
$2.17 billion in 2023. Now, for obvious reasons, I don't really like Jay Gould, and I'm not alone in this. It seems as though he was not incredibly popular at his own time. He didn't leave any of his fortune to charity, which most of the other robber barons we've discussed did when they died. And the New York Times rather indignantly said, and I quote, There is no reason why anybody should have expected Mr. Jay Gould to devise his millions for great benefactions. His career has been remarkable for the entire absence throughout it of any attempt to court public opinion. His fortune was the result of what in a sense may be called a successful warfare against society. It would have been most idle to expect that when he came to make his will, he would forego the habits of a lifetime and recognize in that instrument the claims of the ignorant and the suffering and the defeated in the battle of life in which he had been so victorious, and at last disperse the millions that he had accumulated so toilsomely and held with so firm a grip. His will is the natural outcome of his philosophy of life and of the career in which that philosophy has been put into practice. Jay Gould left his fortune, his property, and his railway holdings to his eldest son, George J. Gould. George J. Gould was born February 6th, 1864. I've been able to find practically no information about him, but it can be supposed that he lost a phenomenal amount of his father's money because when he died in 1923, his fortune was estimated to be a mere $15,054,627, which is equivalent to about $265,732,654.69 in 2023 money. Now that is still a lot of money, but when you compare it to the net worth that his father held when he died, there's a lot of money that's unaccounted for. G.J. Gould also had a lot of debts, and by the time these debts had been settled in 1933, his estate had been reduced to $5,175,590, or approximately $91,355,519.49 in 2023 money. Of this money, $4 million was to be left to his second wife to then be divided amongst their three children upon her death. The rest of the estate was to be divided equally between those three children and the seven children that he had from his first marriage. This means that each of G.J. Gould's children got approximately $500,000 or approximately $11 million in 2023 money. It's safe to say that there are some moderately wealthy Goulds around today, but nowhere near as wealthy as their 19th century ancestors, and a lot of the money that the moderately wealthy Goulds have today seems not to be inherited, but to have been made at various pursuits. In an article entitled, Where Are They Now? Robber Baron Edition, The Atlantic said, and I quote, None of Jay Gould's various children or grandchildren seems to have done anything with the great financier's remaining money except for spend it on polo, tennis, and litigation. In addition to polo, tennis, and litigation, they also wasted the family money on yachting, horse racing, massive alimony payments, and building absurdly ostentatious houses, such as Hempstead House in Long Island, which is an exact copy of Kilkenny Castle in Ireland. So, the Gould family fell, and they fell hard. In this video, it was mostly about the illegal stuff that Jay Gould did, because this guy, oh, gory, he's, uh, he's quite something. <laughs> I really hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and ring the bell notification to receive updates about when I upload new videos. I upload approximately every other week, except for when I'm in finals. And please leave a comment down below if you have anything that you want to share. You should also follow me on Instagram. I'm going to leave a link there in the description below, as well as my email in case you want to contact me. A huge, huge thank you to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Mary Royal, Kit Kat Stitch, Sandra White, Emily Donnelly, Fee Birchwood, Kiara Craft, Amanda Martin, Heather C., Neves Cabara, Mary Mead, and Chelsea Ross. If you'd also like to support this channel on Patreon, I'll leave a link in the description below, but no hard feelings if you can't. I hope to see you around next time. Bye-bye. But it was through wh but it was through railway speculation. <sighs> but it was through railway. <sighs> but it was through railway. <sighs> I sound like Elmer Fudd. But it was through railway speculation. Oh, be very quiet. I'm hunting rabbits. But it was through. But it was through railway. But it was through railway. But it was through railway. <sighs> but it was through rail.